Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Canadian Passive Investing Show. I'm your host, Ava Benasaki, and I'm joined by my co-host, August Vinayaz. We have another great show for you today. Please like and subscribe as it helps us build our channel and allows us to keep bringing you great content and expert guest speakers. Our mission is to empower investors to earn passive income through real estate investing. We're really excited because today we're joined by Damien Lupo. Best-selling author of a dozen books on personal finance, investment, and retirement strategies, Damien is on a mission to free 1 million people from financial bondage. He hosts the Financial Underdogs podcast, ripping conventional wisdom apart for the Main Street investor looking for truth about money and investing. Not only has he started 50-plus companies, he has even founded his own martial art, Yokido? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Damien developed the ultimate investor retirement tool called the EQ, EQRP. His strategy gives individuals total control of their retirement money to invest in real assets like real estate, gold, and crypto. Now, August and I believe this interview with Damien will bring great value to both active and passive investors looking to understand the fundamentals of financial literacy and independence. Welcome, Damien. Thanks Welcome, for being Damien. here. Hey, guys. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Amazing. Well, first off, I just wanted to say how thrilled and honored we are to have you on our show. Um, Having done some research on you, we realized that you are a thought leader in financial literacy, which is which is one of the most fundamental foundations of living a fulfilled life. Um, So, you know, one of the things about that, it's if we a lot of times you guys have heard this where you hear people say, well, money's not that important. And I always look at that and I say, really, yeah, like air isn't important either unless you get stuck under the water and then it's the only thing. And so if, if we don't have money in most parts of the world that become, unless like I've been skydiving or scuba diving in Fiji and there are places where nobody has any money and they have the loincloth and that's it and they're happy and that's it. And it doesn't, money doesn't matter unless you're there. Yeah. They, it really does matter. And so it's, it's important for people to take ownership of it. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the work that I do and what you guys are uh, working on and, and sharing with people. It, it really does help people get out from the, the grips and the bondage of, of the money shackles. Absolutely. And I'm really excited to have this conversation today, Damien. So if you could just start off by telling us, you know, a bit about your background and perhaps your start in real estate, please. Well, it's, it's interesting because you guys are up in, in, uh, in Canada on the, the West side. And I was, I was not too far away. I was a little bit further North. I grew up in Alaska. And, and so that whole experience was very strange in retrospect, because when you're in a place that's basically more distant than Mars, then you, you know, you just, when you, when you leave that, you go, wow, there's a whole world out here. And, and that's, I, I left there and I started doing everything opposite of what I was told to do. And that's, you know, I'm sure my parents were cringing at the time trying to figure out what was happening. I'm going to college and I'm starting bookstores and getting thrown out of school because I put the bookstore out of business and starting businesses with no business experience. And, and so I, I did all these businesses. I did all these things. And I started doing that stuff when I was 11, started my first business, hired my parents when I was 11. And I did that because I didn't like being told no. And, and uh, there's, and I say a nation of snowflakes in the United States, but I think this is in Western civilization. People have gotten soft. They're just used to doing whatever big brother, big sister, the big government, big tech says they can or can't do. And, and I always resisted that. I always pushed back and said, look, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I think this is important with money or, or anything, money, religion. It doesn't make any difference. Like we, we have to be willing to ask questions. And so I just have always asked questions. And then the, I got myself into trouble in the 2000s because I went out there and said, oh, look, I asked some questions. I made some money. I'm so smart. Made this, you know, they built this $20 million real estate portfolio and thought I was invincible. And, and that, that resulted in me losing 25 million. So if you do the math, when you, when you have 20 million and you lose 25 million, that means you're really, really not smart. Like all of a sudden you're pretty dumb. And I realized how not uh, invincible I was. And that was, that was part of the, the transformation process. I think it's important for us to be humbled and sometimes humiliated to learn the truth. And that's when you lose and you go to negative 5 million, I was homeless living out of my vehicle and, and having to start over. One of the things you realize in that process is that mistakes don't kill you unless you're in Alaska and you're in the, in the Arctic Circle, which I was, where you can be eaten by a mistake called a polar bear. Unless that happens, your, your mistakes make you stronger. And we've gotten to the point where most people are so afraid of making a mistake and feeling stupid or being judged that they never grow. They just, it's this idle merry-go-round. And, and so I spent all my time helping to empower people, helping to lend them confidence to get, because people have the ability to be free. I mean, they truly do. And it's, it's really a choice, just like taxes are a choice. 
and with, you know we have all this free will and we we don't we we just let go of it and and allow people to take over our thoughts our thinking our lives and becoming part of the matrix and i have a real big problem with that so i spend my time like this saying what i think needs to be said what jack welch said the former ge ceo he said the missing thing in business today is is candor and the more that we can do that, the more people will start thinking. And, and that's the biggest problem we have in society is people aren't thinking. They're just being emotional and reacting. And that's the, that's the demise of, of any society when people aren't thinking. I love it how Damien just casually dropped some gold there yeah. that taxes are a choice. Yeah. But uh, you know, I have a feeling it's going to be a very interesting conversation. But yeah what, a, yeah, what a story you have. And you've been in real estate for a while now. And you've obviously been through a couple of the downturn cycles. Um, for the newer investors watching our show, if you could please talk to us about your experience to the 2008 financial crisis. Is that when you've seen, you know, you went from 20, minus 25 million? Yeah, 2008 was the thing. And, and what's interesting now is that people that are, have been doing real estate the last decade think that real estate cycles are all up. And that's, I mean, because most things have basically just gone up since we had that that drawdown in 08 to, to 10. And the things do cycle. I mean, I, and I've only been through 20, you know, 22 years of this. What I liked is to hang out with people that are much grayer and balder than me that have been through four or five cycles that are 60, 70 years old. You see most of the money that's managed on Wall Street is being managed by 20s and 30s somethings. This is a big problem. People don't understand cycles. They think that things just kind of keep going up. In real estate, that's the same thing. Because really, since 2008, 9, 10, when I had that big loss, which by the way, when you have that kind of loss, you tend to not want to look at real estate, talk about real estate, or say real estate for many years because it hurts so bad. But that the, the things you learn there, like I said, is the, that the mistakes don't kill you. And and you also realize that you've got to be more of a pessimistic investor. And that's and here's what I mean by that. Every deal is a bad deal until it until it proves itself otherwise. What people are looking at now is, oh, look, these deals are great because the numbers are great. They don't look at the, the one thing that matters more than anything. And then the secret to a great deal is the operator. And that is the thing that you should be vetting more than anything. And if you're the operator, you should be vetting yourself. And if you're, if you're new, you need people with experience. Or if you're an idiot, you need somebody that has intelligence. Like you've got to have the right team. And when you're handing your money to people, I, I see so many people throwing their money around because the numbers look good. You can make any numbers look good. Any spreadsheet can be massaged to where the numbers look amazing. And then all of a sudden your greed glands go crazy. And I, I mentioned emotions. People get emotional about their investing. If you want to get emotional, go get a dog that you love or go jump out of a plane to get the adrenaline, but don't do it in the investing. That's where you're going to get killed because the, the excitement will be taken advantage of by charlatans and snake oil salespeople. That's what happens every day. And unfortunately, it's getting worse. And it doesn't start like that either. You know, uh, when you talk about unscrupulousness in business, it, it doesn't start with somebody wanting to rip people off. It starts small. They're trying to, you know, adjust some numbers. And next thing you know, it just gets worse and worse and mm -hmm. snowballs from, from there. Uh, but to, th there are in some measures that could alleviate the amount of risk, particularly for newer or uh, seasoned uh, operators, is the fact of what I love, uh, preferred returns. You know that that uh, where where you know the investors at least have that base that they're going to be okay with. So mm -hmm. the GP then, as long as there's preferred returns, then the GP you know make sure that the deal that presenting to their investors hits those minimum preferred returns. But I wanted to just briefly touch on that. Absolutely. But yeah, they, and and something that's interesting about preferred returns, they're great as long as there's cash flow. If you don't have cash flow, the the, the preferred return doesn't matter at all. And, and so you want to make sure that you've got something structured. I see deals that are showing up where they're, they're front loaded with tons of fees. You have a pref, you have a preferred return. And yet you're like, well, wait, so what happens if the deal goes bad? The, the, the general partner is making all this money and the limited partners basically just have to wait. I mean, I'm in the middle of helping to fix one right now where the preferred return hasn't been paid in a couple of years. And it's because there wasn't enough money. You still have to pay the, the, the partners because if the partners aren't getting paid, they're just going to bail. Like you're not going to work for free. And, and people like to say that they're going to work for free, but the reality is you still have to feed yourself and you get exhausted from a deal. So th it's important that pref it can be useful. I have deals that we've put pref, I have deals that we don't have pref. And so there is value that, to it. It's, it's not the end all be all for some people. They think, oh, I've got pref and then that's everything. It still starts with the people. You got to make sure the people are going to operate this thing into profitability. Absolutely, 100%. And cumulative and compounding preferred returns. <laughs> I don't know about compounding, but cumulative definitely would be very important. <laughs> All okay, right. great.
So Damien, we were watching a video um, uh, on, on YouTube and, and you were explaining the financial freedom formula, uh, your wealth runway. Um, could you explain this concept to us? I know you don't have your whiteboard behind you right now, but in theory, if you may please just kind of explain it. So there's this idea that I, that I learned and really started to think about from Buckminster Fuller, who was probably the smartest person in the 20th century, maybe ever. Uh, Einstein said, this guy is smarter than me. He's the smartest person. And, and if Einstein's saying that, that's it probably says something. And he, and he basically says the, the function or the formula for how wealthy you are is how many days you can survive based on your resources. And so if you think about that, all of us have a certain burn rate. We have a, a runway, like how much, how much it costs us to live just baseline. And maybe that's $5,000 per month. So if you have $10,000 in your checking account or brokerage account, you literally have two months of wealth. That's how wealthy you are. If you've got, let's say you've got, uh, you have cash flow and, and it's, it's your cash flow is $2,000 per month. And then you've got some cash. Well, that cash flow helps alleviate that pressure of your expenses. So now you only have 3000 you're burning per month. Most people have less than a year of wealth. And so you think about that and you go, well, wait, how do I fix that? It's about creating the cash flow that over that overruns and exceeds your expenses, which is not complicated in theory. Like you have to think about that. The the goal though is to multiply that. So if you if you're spending five thousand and and you, you say okay I'm going to go build five thousand dollars worth of passive cash flow, that's cool. Except if you think you're free because you have five thousand of passive cash flow, what happens when something stalls for a month and all of a sudden you're going backwards? So the idea really for everybody is is to figure out how to create investments or to be a part of investments where you double or triple your expenses, and that's because things don't go perfectly. This is the real world, not school, where you have to get a 90% to get an A or get 50% to get to pass, or actually 50% you fail. The reality is things, think, we have cycles, we have recessions, things go sideways. And so you, the, the idea with the, the freedom formula is to get past the point where you have to be nervous that you might actually run out of money or that you're not gonna be able to pay. You don't wanna be going backwards. And I think that that's the thing that's the scariest for people run into a lot of people that have money and, and they say, I'm going to take a sabbatical and they've, they've got their two or $300,000 and they spend a, a couple of months and they're just watching that number go down and it freaks them out. And so when we're going backwards, we tend to go into a state of panic and anxiety. And so finding the, the, the strategy. So over the next five or 10 years, however long it takes, you move past your expenses by a factor of two or three, it really does take the stress off so that you can spend what my good buddy said is is the purpose of life which is finding your purpose his his grandmother said retire as early as you can so that you can spend the rest of your life finding your purpose and you can't really retire if you don't have passive income i don't care how many millions of dollars you have in the bank because you're going to look at those things and they're going to be shrinking every year and you're going to freak out and you're going to go back to work well you don't have your time anymore you've you've lost your freedom so it's it's important to figure out how to build that type of asset that's producing cash that's paying for you instead of you going out there and trading your time for money Got it. Got it. And is there a sweet spot? So let's uh, let's say, for example, the example you use is four thousand dollars of of income. Is there a sweet spot be, uh, between having a savings and also having passive income cash flow? And and what does that look like? So let's say someone who makes uh, four thousand dollars a month from their job, uh, should they have forty thousand dollars in savings, four hundred thousand dollars in savings, and how much should the cash flow be? What is the perfect balance there, or is the goal? to go 100% passive income, what would be the perfect formula uh, from, uh, you know, Damien's, uh, Damien's loophole's formula for that? So it's, what's interesting is you hear a lot of financial gurus out there and people that are teaching about money and, and they'll say that if you have, if you have cash, that's stupid, you should be using it. If you have a house that's paid off, that's stupid, you should be leveraging it. And I think that they're stupid for saying that because they're not looking at the emotional consequences. When, when you have no debt on a house, that rich people don't have debt on their homes, on their, their, their pride, they're like, they're, where they live. They have debt on investments, but they don't have it on their homes. That's just, you just don't see it. Like nobody's that dumb. It's, it's a tool we use when we're newer, earlier, when we're trying to build something. But when you're maintaining wealth and you're, and you want sanity, there's, it's called getting rid of the debt on your, on the stuff that you're staring at at night. And in terms of cash, one of the things that I love people doing, and I see this a lot, there's something kind of weirdly magical. And this is based on today, 2022, about having a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. And people would say, well, that's a lot of money just sitting dead and it's getting inflated away. Yeah, there's also something about not waking up going, ah, I'm only at $15,000 and I might actually have to go to zero and you start panicking. So I, and then that's, let's assume you're spending 5,000 bucks a month. It's basically a couple of times what you spend a year having that in the bank. There is a calming effect to doing that and it allows you to spend your time 
connecting with people, like creating whatever you're going to create. And so you're not stressed. If you're stressed, you're in a really low state of energy and it's, it doesn't allow you to show up the best you can. And that's just, I mean, I've seen this over the years with myself and with other people, when cash is small and debt is high, the stress creates like the monster version of you. When you take the debt away and you, and you, and you have the cash, there is something that's, that allows you to really show up in the most authentic way possible and create the biggest possible impact. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. That's a great viewpoint because yeah. you talk about particularly you, you, you differentiated a primary residence debt and other investment debts. Yeah. And I, I, I connect with you there 100%. Uh, unfortunately, here in, in, in Vancouver, most people's investments, uh, Vancouver and Toronto, larger cities in Canada, most people's main investment is their primary residence just because the medium income is 90,000 medium home price is 1.2 million. So pretty hard to get approved for that. And then when they do that, that becomes their, you know, main nest egg. And that's what you go to, to borrow against, to make investments and what have you. And they, there's an actual, there's an actual, um, a, a process for that. There is a whole ecosystem, which, uh, teaches of how to leverage against your primary residence to, uh, take loans and make investments, but we won't get into that. And we'll go to our next topic here. <laughs> um, okay. So let's discuss this very confusing topic. Uh, you know, in life, when someone needs anything, you, you know, has a need for something, the best way to go about it to remedy that need is to seek professional help. So your tooth hurts, you go see a dentist, your roof leaks, you call a roofer, your car breaks down, you go see a mechanic, you know, on and on and on. Uh, but this is where it gets really weird. OK, when 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 you need help with finances and to grow your wealth, the common sense is to go see a financial advisor. Why is it? <clears throat> and, I, and I really mean this. Why is it that by the account of many financial experts, including yourself and many others I've spoken to, many others I've, uh, you know, I've read about, is that, uh, you know, financial advisors are not the only answer, but are, at times are the wrong man for the job. Talk to us about this concept because, you know, it is a bit, uh, you know, weird, like I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, here, here's the craziest part. Financial advisor is basically a lie to start with. Just even talking about what that, is. like, okay, when we talk about a financial advisor, we're talking about somebody that sells financial products. We're not really talking about somebody that, is a holistic financial support system for your life. And that's the big difference. Financial advisor should not be giving advice. And I, and I say that with all sincerity, what they're trained to do is sell their products. And so when you think about it, what you're really looking for, when people come to me and they say, can you help it? Can you provide some advice? And, and I, you know what, I provide a lot of questions because I know that people have their own answers. If they're led down the path with questions, they'll say, oh, okay. And, and ultimately we are our own guru. I think there was a Netflix documentary that, that was that Tony Robbins did and, he, and it said, I am not your guru. Tony is smart. Tony has the ability to trigger things and open you up with questions. Financial advisors, they, they had to rename themselves and just call themselves what they are. Finance, it's like the, like in the United States, we have the, the, the defense department. It's not the defense department. It used to be authentic. It was called the war department. Now we call it the defense department. No, it isn't. It's a war making department. Financial advisors are financial salespeople. So it's, if we just honestly said what they were, then I think we would have a different conversation. People get confused and they go, well, my financial advisor said this. And I'm like, what, what are they doing? They're trying to sell you stuff. And not all of them are like that, but 90 plus percent of them do that. And so everybody seems to think that their financial advisor, watch what happens when you pull your financial, your money out of the financial advisor's pockets. They are no longer your friend. You're like, wait, I go to church with them. My kids play t-ball with them. And, then and they won't talk to me. They told me to go piss off. And like, like that all of a sudden makes you like, wow, maybe they're not my friend. They're not your friend. They're friends with your money. And, and that's just the reality of the system. And when you, there's a great book called Thinking for a Change that I read years ago. And you have to have different thinkings around things. You can't just be Pollyanna and think everything is great and be Mr. or Mrs. Optimistic. I did that for years. And then I had a, a, a train drive over me because I didn't have any pragmatic or pessimistic or, or practical thinking around cycles or the fact that people were going to abuse me. Like the, the world's a tough place and financial advisors are there to make money for them and for their company. When you happen to make money, that's a damn accident. That is not, I mean, they'll say it and they'll in their heart, but what are they going to do? Are they going to tell you to go buy real estate when they can't make a commission? No. And if they do, it's going to be like, oh yeah, maybe 5% because that's risky. It's a bunch of freaking bullshit. Right. It's not, it's not honest. And so I have a really hard time with this idea of financial advisors because most of them aren't worth the, you know, they're just, they're, they're not really worth anything. They're there to take money from you and trap it for the rest of your life. 
Yeah, I've, I've, you know, Damien, I've talked to many, many financial advisors over the, like, let's say the last year or so, and I'm trying to tell them about this incredible investment that we, that we can provide to investors. And the first thing they say is like, oh, I'm not interested. I can't sell that to my clients because it's not on our shelf. And it's very disappointing because I'm like, hey, I'm trying to make a snowball effect here where I can help a lot of people, but they totally just like brush it off. So I get what you're saying, 100%. I can relate to that. Yeah, no, it was probably one of the best descriptions I ever heard about financial advising because it's something that it is so unusual and we, we we research this a lot as you know somebody who's supposed to be an expert in a in a field but they can't give you the best advice on top of that they're restricted into the products they can yeah, sell and they yeah. have somewhat of an agenda to push that product uh so that's it makes it very confusing as well and that's why a market for us even exists that's why smaller real estate private equity firms like us can bring in an offering which provides you know eight percent pref and a 15 to 20 percent annualized return mm -hmm. so it's uh you know that's uh that, that that's why this market exists because Absolutely. you know they've allowed us to to be here um so Absolutely. that's a good thing awesome so i'm really excited to dive into the next topic damien i want to talk about iras <laughs> <laughs> if you could explain what are what are iras and as you know we're located in canada but most of our business is done in the us and many of our investors and viewers are americans um but for those who don't know what an ira is if you could please explain and tell us again, what is the issue with the conventional IRA and what is your answer to all of this? So IRAs are individual retirement accounts and what, and really what they are in 401ks and all these different things, they're, they're tax shelters. The US government in its wisdom, whether you believe that or not, that there is any wisdom there, Congress created rules to try to help people plan for their retirement because Congress knows that there's, well, I mean, they do these things. The government understands that there's not enough wealth that the government has that can support people in their retirement. They need to have people doing it themselves. And so they set these things up in, their, in the 70s, IRAs and 401ks. They were set up so that people would start putting money away for the future. And then of course, the Federal Reserve and the central banks go and steal it through inflation. So it's kind of like, okay, well, wait, are, are we just going backwards here? But the, the retirement accounts are a tool that people have because if you just go invest and typically you're going to, you're going to be giving away your money and it's going to be compounding against you because you're going to lose 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of it every year in Canada, it's probably even more if you're not being smart about how you're using structures and, and the tax planning IRAs are one step. That's the default step <clears throat> for people that are, that are using a shelter. The, the problem with IRAs is that one, they typically are pretty restrictive for what you can do. And even if you do a fully functioning self-directed IRA, there are consequences with taxes that most people don't know about. They go invest in real estate. People get excited. They use their self-directed IRA to go invest in real estate, and then they get a tax bill. I mean, an, an average IRA investor that uses their money to go invest in a syndication, and they've got a preferred return, and they're all excited because they made 15 or 20%. They take 100000 double it to two hundred, and all of a sudden, they get a $25,000 tax bill in an IRA today. And they, and they wonder, well, how did this happen? It's because nobody told them because it's all about following, it's all about the money. Custodians and these systems are meant to get the money and not tell you the whole truth. And so the, the other option, like what we spend our time doing is, is setting up a different type of account and it's under a different part of the tax code. There are different rules. So what we're doing is we're, we're figuring out the best strategy. When I said taxes are optional, they are. You have to dig deeper and you have to ask people harder questions. The challenge is you don't know what questions to ask. In the beginning, you're like, well, I don't know which direction is up. So how do you get around that? I mean, the question people should be doing is, what do I do first? The first thing you do is go around rich people and hang out with them and listen to them and start modeling them, finding a mentor. Like I'm kind of going off on a tangent here because I think people get, they start investing without having any knowledge. And one of the easiest things you can do and one of the smartest that almost nobody does, find somebody that's already been through it that is doing it and show up and start making their life better, solving their problems, and you're going to become invaluable to them. One of the dumbest things you can do is go to that person and say, hey, what can I do to help you? look, I don't have time to figure out what you can do to help me. But I guarantee you, if you show up in my life and you start doing things for me and start supporting me, I'm going to say, wow, I want to keep you around. And I'm going to spend time and energy and I'm going to start mentoring or helping you. It's a reciprocity law that Cialdini talks about in influence. And it's also just practical. Like I want people that are givers. I don't want people that are takers. When people say, what can I give you? Because I know what they want. They want something. I go, eh, you're just, you're trying to figure out how to take from me. And so that's what people should be doing. And I know we started with IRAs. The, the point though, for people is you got to go get around people that have Peter Thiel in the US. He was partners with Elon Musk in, in PayPal. He's now one of the biggest venture capitalists in the, in the world. He has a $5 billion Roth IRA. You 
get, get around P Peter, read his book, Zero to One. Figure out what these people are thinking, what they're doing, what their habits are, and model them. And, and I guarantee you they're going to be doing th things differently than what the Wall Street Journal or CNBC or Jim Cramer says. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And um, now how, how can, is this, a, uh, is this a process you have in place? How does it work if somebody wants to contact you to, to structure their, their IRAs or their investments the right way? Like what is the next step someone can take if they're watching this? So basically, when, when we look at retirement accounts, there's a way to be tax free permanently, and it's not through the IRA. It's, it's through what we, what we do is the EQRP. And what we're going to do is we're going to blow up the IRA. We're going to basically transfer. It's not a taxable event. It's not, there's, there's no penalties or anything. We're getting people out of the IRAs so that they can actually have command and control of their, their assets. They can invest in real estate. They can invest in crypto, in, in gold, all these other things out there, and they're not getting taxed. So there's the, the process of doing that is getting educated. So I, I wrote a, I, it's one of the books I wrote. And here's a, a funny thing. If you ever look at books and you ask yourself, why would somebody write the book, a book like that? One, they want to share information because they want other people to be able to see it. And they want to see, have a lot of people see it, not just the one-on-one -on -one conversations. So it creates leverage for me. I, I write books because it allows me to clarify my thinking. If you, if you think, you know, something, try writing a book about it. You realize how dumb you are. I, I mean, I've realized this like a dozen times, like, man, I'm dumb. So I got to figure it out. I got to go deeper and like study what I already thought I knew. And, and so that's, that's what happens. And, and when you get a book out there that people will actually say, I learned a lot from that, you know, you've accomplished something. It's easy to have a book that you wrote. Like I see books now where people will, will record their podcast and then they transcribe it and they call that a book. And I call that brain damage trying to read it. And so I, I would suggest that if you want to write a book, you better be willing to put a lot of, um, a lot of energy and a lot of frustration into it. Cause it's, it's like having a blue whale being pregnant with a blue whale. It will hurt like sitting in you and you're like, oh my God, get this thing out. And then eventually you have to get it out, but you're, you're like, you're stuck. So it's, that's the best process that, that we, we have for anything is the education process. We're not here to sell something. What we're here is to do is to educate. And then people that want to buy it are going to buy it. That's how we'd like to do business. I think that that's when you're investing, it should be the same way. You should be excited about going and doing the thing because somebody has educated you to the point where you're like, this makes complete sense. Not because they asked you the, the buying questions and then you got, you got tricked into doing it and they stole your credit card, which is unfortunately how a lot of marketing works. And so we have a different approach, educate people. And then the people that go, yeah, I want to be responsible. I want to be financially free. They're naturally going to say, yeah, of course I want to get rid of my IRA and have an EQRP. That's what makes sense because I don't want to pay taxes ever again. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I love, yeah, you know, there's there's a huge misconception about these self-directed IRAs. Um, so I thought the whole point of it was to use yourself, use your IRA money, put it into real estate, get the money back, put it back into your IRA, and it's not, and it's tax-free. Um, and, and, and that was what people were told. And that's what they did. Unfortunately, right. they're getting, so a couple of things have changed. One, people are realizing if you invest in real estate, most real estate has debt. And if you use an IRA for that, you're going to have this big old UBIT tax. It's unrelated business income tax. That is one of the biggest problems. And then we're seeing people that are getting giant tax bills, hundreds of thousands of dollars, because nobody told them this. That's the first problem. The second problem is that the, the US tax court made checkbook IRAs illegal in, no, in November. So if you have a checkbook IRA and you're actually investing directly, that's illegal. That's disqualified. That is exactly what the court said. They said you cannot have command of your assets. And what that means is physically holding the checkbook, physically holding the gold, physically holding the crypto, whatever it is, you cannot have command. The custodian has to have oversight. That's the entire point of custodians. That's for IRAs. But with an EQRP, you get to be the trustee. You get to be in charge. Because you're in charge legally, the code says you have to choose it. You can pick it. You can be it. You can actually have possession and the checkbook. It completely changes the game. You don't have to get somebody's permission or, or, or kiss the ring to go do a deal. You can literally just write the dang check. Oh, that's really cool what you guys have to. And, and obviously yeah. you can still invest in syndications if you wish. Through. And, and that's one of the great things too, because there's no UBIT tax. An EQRP is exempt from UBIT tax. You go make $100,000 and it's leveraged. You get to keep the whole $100,000 in profit. Whatever the profit is, you keep it. IRAs, you're going you're gonna to waste 20 to 35% on the tax. And so there, yeah, you, I mean, it's when you start looking at all the options, you realize, wait, this is like this is like a Ford versus a Ferrari, and why would I do the Ford? I mean, unless because they're they're both cars, and that's where it ends. And that's IRAs are basically a, a Ford. They have four wheels, and you've got some options, but that thing is going to break down and it's going to hammer you. And it's it, 
I mean, that you, you really have to do your homework. And I think that unfortunately people feel just stressed and busy and they're, and they, and they go, well, I'll take whatever is in front of me and whatever somebody's selling. And so this is, this is why I wrote the book to give people the actual information and to, and to show, Hey, a versus B, they're not the same thing. This is an apple and this is a dog. It's not apples and oranges. It's an apple and a dog, like pick which one you want different, different things. And we'll, we'll definitely add cool. in the show notes the link to the book. Awesome. Yeah, let's, yeah, for sure. I want to talk about time management. With like, let's, yeah, let's definitely change the conversation here to from um, you know all this deep dive into yeah, yeah, financing yeah, sure. and financial world. Let's talk about. I mean, you're you're an author of twelve books. If I if I have that right, you yeah, might, yeah, you might be in the process so. of writing more, and that's really incredible. <laughs> Talking about writing books, Ava co-authored a book, and I was uh, you know. A part of that process and I know how much it goes into just to co-author oh, a book yeah. let alone write a book and let alone write 12 of them so I definitely understand that uh, the, the process of it goes into it. but please yeah Eva, if you want to we're ask. just curious we're curious how do you manage all of your time like for us you know you know we're we're we have a hard time managing just building one company <laughs> and you've managed several uh so if you could just talk to us how do you ma- like time management and how do you go about doing well, one of the things that I think it's important to, for everybody to realize is that you can't save time you, and it's really, you can't manage time. You can spend time. So you choose how you spend time. So that maybe is kind of how we think about managing, but people oftentimes think about management in a different way. Time is something that you don't get back. And so you have to start realizing the first thing you have to do best is saying no. And you have to be willing to say that. I see a lot of people that are, it, I call it the trust tax. And it's, it's the tax that you pay on, on, on thinking you need to do everything yourself. And what happens is you run out of time and you don't get things done and you spend a lot of time doing things that you shouldn't be doing because somebody else can do those and your time is worth more in that specialized space. Napoleon Hill talked about that, about specialized information and specialized professional, whatever you're doing. There's power in doing that and not doing anything else. And unfortunately, everybody wants, especially smart people, smart people want to do everything. We just had one of our clients that, so we do some of these services and we did a service that it was about $300 for the year. And this particular person's worth about $5 million. And he wanted to do this service himself because he thought, oh, that's not that hard. So he did it. He saved himself $300. And I just got a text message a few days ago. And he said, I got a letter from the IRS and they're, they're, they say I owe them $60,000 because I did this form wrong. And I said, well, yeah, you did the form. And I wish you hadn't. And I told you we did it, but you, you thought you want, I didn't, I didn't beat him up too bad because the bill was the beating up of, of the deal. And, and so he thought it would be a good use of his time to spend a couple of hours doing this thing when the guy makes a million dollars a year. And this is how people manage their time. They waste time. And so that, so how do I, how do I manage my time? My primary goal is to not waste time. So this is with people. I don't have conversations with people that are going to waste my time. And, and I look at the things that I can hire other people to do, and I, and I hire them. Anything I can hire somebody to do, one, it's helpful for the economy. It, it, provides, it provides employment, which is what we need. And, and I, I think that's important. And then I can focus on the things that are, that are part of my purpose. I don't think my purpose is mowing my lawn. I think that's one of the dumbest things I can do. And some people are like, that's the only time I get away from my kids because they make me crazy. I need, I need, I need the quiet of the lawnmower so they can have, some, have a break from all the chaos of my kids. Like, okay, I get that. But there's so many things that we do that are wasting time. And, and we think, well, yeah, but I would have to pay somebody. You know what? You'd have to think bigger. This is part of being small-minded and scarcity-minded instead of saying there's so much abundance and I'm going to trust it. If you don't trust it, you tend to default back and your, your calendar is full of crap. So my calendar is, is blocked out on, on purpose. And I'm just, I'm really a lot more thoughtful about who gets access to me and, who, and, and how my time is spent because it is spent and, and then it's gone. And you can't get it back. And so that's, that's the thing people, you have to ask yourself, what is that primary thing? How do you start that? You blank slate your, cal- your calendar and your life. So I, I call this the blank slate principle. Take everything off the calendar and start from scratch. I do this with my house. I start when I move. I, I come into the house and I go, okay, what do I want in here? I don't just take all my crap from the previous house and dump it in my new house. I literally start off going, what do I want? And when I pull in the things that I want, whatever's left gets donated. It's the same thing with my calendar. Every year I blast out all my meetings. I literally cut them off my calendar so my calendar's blank. And then I say, what do I really want? First thing I want to do is make sure that I have as few meetings as possible. So any default meetings don't even show up. Somebody has to prove to me why it's important for the meeting to happen. And I'm not going to just have it every week just because somebody wants to connect. Like that's not a good enough reason. So blank slating, and it's, you can do this with your food. 
you literally take everything out of your kitchen and you go, what are the things that really make sense versus the crap that's six years old that's rotting in your cupboard? It's the same principle. You start playing slate and then you own your entire 168 hours every week. If you don't do that, you're like, well, I got to find time for this thing. No, you don't. You got the same 24 hours that Bill Gates or Oprah Winfrey have. If you actually started with what matters, but we tend to start with whatever's been defaulting from the legacy crap from our life last year. Incredible advice. Incredible, Incredible advice. advice. Yeah. We're talking about advice. Yeah. This is our next question here. <laughs> talking about advice. Damien, what advice do you have for a passive investor looking to start investing in real estate private equity? Don't be passive. <laughs> Wait, what? That doesn't make any sense for the passive investor. Here's what I mean by that. If you say, okay, I'm going to be a passive investor and I'm just going to hand my money over, you're not going to learn anything. My suggestion for a passive investor is to be engaged. Find a way to learn through your money. Make your money teach you. So go do something and say, hey, I actually want to be a part of this. Go find people that are doing deals where you can be behind the curtains. The deals that we've done over the years, my partner and I will have deals. And if people say, I want to invest and I want to learn, great. We'll bring you behind the curtain. You can see the stuff that's going on. And that way you'll actually develop confidence. It'll help you understand how to do, how to be a better passive investor. If you think that having a high return is how you're a good investor and then, oh, look, I made 27%. I'm a good, no, you're not. You just got lucky. How do you know how to do that again? Unless you actually understand the mechanics of the deal, you understand how to do a deal better because of the previous deal. So how do you, how do you be a great passive investor? Don't be passive, be active. Wow. Great wow, advice. Nice. Great advice. Awesome. All right. So, I, I, you know, uh, sorry to many of the guests who've been on our show, but this is one of my favorite shows we've ever done before. And my apologies. But now it's to the next segment of the show. Um, the 10 championship rounds to financial freedom. So I'm going to get started. Whatever comes top of mind. Damien, here we go. First question. Who is the most influential person in your life? I mean, it, it, here's, here's, here's the way to answer that. There's people that inspire you and there are people that warn you. And, and the, most in, the most inspirational or the most the person that had the biggest am impact is probably my dad, because I, as much as I loved him before he passed away and I still love him, he was a great warning to me. He didn't live his life on offense. He lived it on defense. He was constantly trying to figure out how to protect himself. And what he did is he didn't live. So he died with regret. And so that was one of the greatest gifts I ever got right before he died. When he said, you know, there were so many things that I wanted to do and I'm out of time. And that was me learning a, a priceless lesson there that, I'm not going to have this life forever and it's time to take action and it's time to live. And that's, a, that's a lesson for all of us that regret is the ultimate hell. Amazing. Oh. Amazing. Amazing story. All right, Damien. Uh, what is the number one book you'd recommend? Other than my 12, which, you know, none of those are, <laughs> I mean, they're, they are what they are. I, I love mastery and I, and I love mastery and this is not Robert Greene's book, which is, I'm sure is very good. It's by George Leonard. It's a book. He's a federal, a fellow martial artist. And, and so the point of mastery in martial arts or anything is to go deep. Seth, um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell talked about this in Outliers and the 10,000 hour principle where you do something for 10,000 hours and then you actually start to develop mastery. With martial arts, I've spent about 20,000 hours training. And, and there's this, it's, it's not that you get to a place where you're a master. It's the process of mastery where you're willing to go in, into a plateau state where something it seems like it's the same thing for a year or two and then you pop out of it. The point of mastery is it develops you and you're able to be focused. If you don't focus on something and don't pursue mastery, you're going to find that your life is really just about you chasing, chasing drunk or chasing shiny nuts like a drunk squirrel. Like that, it's really unfortunate. But social media helps people become very drunk squirrels all the time because they're they're just unlimited shiny nuts. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. All right. Next question: If you had the opportunity to travel back in time, what advice would you give your younger self? Enjoy your hair because it's cold when you're bald. And absolutely <laughs> fall, fail faster. And it's, and when you, I, we are so conditioned to not make mistakes. And the, the reality is nobody gives a crap. When you make a mistake, it, people are so focused on their own stuff. Like if you've ever walked down the street and you trip over nothing, like there's like what, there's nothing there. And I tripped over it and you're like stumbling around. And then what do we do? We look around. Did anybody see that? Are they laughing at me? We're constantly concerned about the judgment. And unfortunately, this is where you see a lot of, like younger girls that are on online and they're all the bullying and they're so concerned and they're it's like their image and, and the judgment that the confidence is, is such a big deal. So uh, I would tell myself, nobody gives a crap truly. And I had a mentor that said that to me one time, he said, you have no idea how powerful you will be in your life until you get to the point where you don't care what anybody thinks. Absolutely. Wow. Nice. Advice. Okay. Right. 
I'm excited for this one. Damien, what is the best investment you've ever made? The, all the, all the investments, the personal development work that I've done on myself, including the, the almost two years of, of work with Frank that I did, he was a, he's a therapist and a fellow martial artist I trained with. And we spent two years asking one question, what is true? And that led to reinvented life. The book I wrote in, in 2012, the, that work is the best investment. People say, well, where should I put my money? And I say, in you, you'll never have a better return than the money you put in yourself. And they say, yeah, but which, which thing is it real estate or is it Bitcoin? And I go, you're missing the point, but you know what they're doing? They're trying to, they're trying to hack it. They, they, Tim, they're trying to Tim Ferriss themselves love four hour work, work week, but there is no four hour personal development. Like it takes years and it takes a commitment and it takes time and it takes money. That's where the money should go first. Somebody says, I have $10,000. What do I do? And I go, go buy all the courses and then do the work. Don't just buy the courses and put them on your shelf. Go do the courses, do them, activate them, be active. Don't be passive. That's where you get the best returns hundred percent of the time. Fantastic. All right. Now what's the worst investment you've ever made and what lesson did you learn from it? So I, I invested in a restaurant and it was a restaurant because I used to go to this restaurant and they shut down and I happened to love the muffins. I went in there and I was like, oh, these are amazing muffins. And, and when I, when the restaurant closed down, I ended up buying the owner's son's house and I found the owner in the house. And I said, where's the restaurant? I missed the muffins. And she said, well, I'm looking for money to reopen it. And I said, well, I would love to help. And so somehow a year later, I ended up being in the middle of a, of a restaurant and this year happened to be 2008. Ooh. So in that process, I ended up spending $100,000 on a half-built restaurant, and I never got those muffins. Oh, oh okay. Okay. I know. It's sad because I wanted those muffins are really good. But, yeah. <laughs> Darn muffins. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Damon. How much would you need in the bank to retire today? What's your number? So uh, money in the bank is never, is never going to actually allow somebody to retire. It's, you, you've got to have intelligence because you'll always be afraid that, you're gonna, that it's going to disappear. So the, like they asked somebody the, the, the ominous or the, you know, the mystical, they asked Henry Ford that, and they said, well, what happens if you lose all your money? Because you know, you're, you're rich, but yeah, what happens if your money, he goes, I would have it back in five years. And, and that's, that's the thing about having money in the bank or people that have retirement accounts, they wake up at 55, 60 years old and they're scared to death. They have 2 million, they have 5 million in the bank. I run into people all the time, have the same conversation. They're afraid that they're going to run out and they don't have time to recreate it because they don't know how they did recreate it. They, they created it on accident. And that's how most people are. So if you, it's not about how much money in the, you have in the bank. It's about how much experience you have and how much wisdom you have that's in between your ears. That's the, that's the number. It's the volume of that power and that confidence. When you have the confidence, take all the money. If I lose all my money, I will have it all back and more in five years. Like I've done this and I've done it over and over again. I'm not concerned about it. I don't try to lose my money. I don't hate my money. I like my money. Like we have a relationship. It's a little bit of a love affair. You want to date me? You got to date my money too. Like there's a thing. So I, I would I would say that the the golden, the formula is not about a pile of money in the bank and there is no number. Because I remember making a million and then 2 million and then having 5 million and it never, I was never done. So the money is, is an illusion. It's this, it's like, it, it, it's a shadow and it, it's never going to be enough. You're never going to be fulfilled or content. So what I would suggest is that there's a minimum amount you should have in liquidity that will make you so that you're not thinking about whether or not you're going to have money to pay for your gas tomorrow or whatever it is you're using to, to live. So it's more about the experience. And then you realize, and going back, because I, I did want to bring this up because this is important. When you, when you think about, how much money you need to, to invest. You really don't need money to invest. And when, and this, this had to do with, when you said people have houses, they're 1.2 million, they make 90,000. They, and then they borrow money out of their house. And I go, why did you do that? And, and people are like, well, cause it's an asset. I, you know, I've got this money available. I can borrow. And they tell me I can, well, who tell the person that gets the fees off selling you the mortgage. Okay, fine. I get this. What is a better idea is the hard idea. And it's lazy to take money. It's hard to go use your brain. People that are lazy use their cash. And so one of the, one of the challenges I have for people listening, watching is to figure out how to do deals without money, use other people's money, use your brain. It's hard. And guess what? It's unlimited. So that's where you go exponential. That's where you can become financially free in a matter of years, not decades. At least supplement your investment too at the bare minimum, right? If you're putting in a hundred, get somebody else to put in a hundred. So hundred percent. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. All right. If you could have dinner with someone dead or alive, who would it be? I, you know, I would really love to, to, to meet my grandfather, uh, either one of them, any of them. And it's, it's just because there's, it, it would help me understand what the hell is wrong with my dad. Uh, it, you know, you just like you, 
<laughs> how did this happen is my question, you know, like, and, and so I, one of the things I think we, we really forget is that people are not going to last forever. And, and we, we, I never had a chance because they, they all died before, either before I was born or right after I was born. I have a lot of people in my life being in my forties that are losing parents. And what I, what I love is people that I know that are in, in their twenties and they have parents that are probably going to be around for 20, 30, 40 more years. And so I, I really focus a lot of time and energy on encouraging them to engage those, those relationships because they do go away and it would be nice. I mean, even just having one conversation with the people that are gone, just to understand, like, I think it helps us to understand ourselves better. Like, I don't really care if I ever talk to Abraham Lincoln or, or, you know, Genghis Khan or any, like, it doesn't that, you know, it doesn't really matter. I would like to know where I came from. That'd be nice. Amazing. 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 All right. Um, if you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing now? If I wasn't doing what I was doing today, I'd probably be thinking about what I'm doing today and wondering why I'm not doing it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's the, the mission that I have to, to break people's financial shackles. It doesn't matter whether it's retirement accounts or something else, financial education, there's, there's something compelling about doing work that serves others. And one of the things I see when people are out there trying to make money, what they're missing is that that's, that should be the side effect. Making money should not be making money is nobody's purpose. Making money is an offshoot of the impact you have on the world and on, on people's lives. And when, the more you do that, the more this money is, it's a 90, 90 degree effect from that. And people miss that. So they're, they, they constantly think that they're money bees instead of being honey bees. Go focus on the honey, the money follows. And I would be finding a way to serve people because I can't, I wake up every day and I, I fall asleep in the middle of doing it. And it happens seven days a week because I'm obsessed and not obsessed. I used to be obsessed about money. I got to get another dollar. I got to figure out who got my money. Like I'm, you know, I, love a lot of Grant Cardone's books, but I don't follow this idea that I go into a room and figure out who's got my money. And I, I had one of those bumper stickers until I threw it away because it was the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. It was, that's success. I believe in fulfillment. Fulfillment comes from service. Success comes from taking. And just quickly to add to that is also, I mean, it's uh, to, to create a successful business, you, uh, you know, you want to solve a problem. And by solving that problem, money just becomes a byproduct of it. That's something that I'm yeah. not sure if I take it for, took it from somewhere or I've learned over the years, but that's the, that's another way of saying it. Love it. All right. All right, Damon, book smarts or street smarts. So street smarts will not only keep you alive, but allow you to, to prosper in relationship. And I think relationship is where, where everything happens. Book smarts will get you a government job and, and then you get to be a manager. I, I don't think that that's, you, you can learn everything you need to learn in the streets. If you're willing to go take, take a step into the wild. And, and, and look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not dumb. I'm not going to pretend to be dumb. I think some people pretend to be dumb and it's like a technique. And, and I don't think that that's necessarily a great thing. I also know that there's way more that I don't know. And so I'm constantly out in the real world learning. There's no greater teacher than the real world. A book is never going to teach you as much as the streets and the trenches and where you bleed. And, and, and that, that's, that's the thing, but it's dangerous. And that's why people don't do it. They'd rather sit behind a book. That's why people stay in, in college or uni forever. They never want to leave. They go, oh, it's safe. It's all perfectly choreographed here. And I, and I laugh and I'm like, well, you just stay there and your, your, your little illusion behind, you know, in the wizard, you know, the Oz where, where, you, where things aren't real. It's hard. It's painful. It's bloody. It's muddy in the real world. And that's, that's where all the growth happens. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the human needs that every, every, every human being has six primary needs. And one of those is growth. And if you're in school, there's only so much that you're going to grow from just reading books. And when I hear somebody that has advanced degrees and they're, and they're quoting all these different philosophers and things. And I'm like, yeah, but you've never actually been in the real world. So like, do you really feel fulfilled? And I'm almost embarrassed for him. I'm definitely, I definitely feel sorry for him. All right. Okay. Damien, this is the last question. If you had a million dollars cash and you had to make one investment today, what would it be? I'd hire more people, which is what I do. I've, I have a, I have a game I play with myself and it's, it's, it's actually in a, a book that I have called my life book. And this life book has all the different categories of my life. And I, I built another category. It's called the, the game I play with money. And, the, and, the, and it starts off with $1,000 and I 10X it. It's 1,000 to 10, 100,000 to million, 10 million. And so I know exactly what I'll do with these different piles. So an extra thousand dollars happens to come in. I know what I'm going to do with it already. I'm not repelling it. I have a plan for it. So guess what? It shows up. An extra million dollars shows up. Like these things happen because I have a plan. Capital respects people that have respect for it. And so a million dollars to me is a way for me to bring in more people into my, my culture, the right people. And, and it, it allows us to serve more people because people are the ultimate weapon. 
people think software is where it's at. And I get it. Software is eating up everything. Mark Andreessen said this software is eating the world. Yeah, that's true. There's no competition when you have the human touch. There is a ton of competition in automation and you're never going to be as good as Microsoft or Amazon or the next big massive quadrillion dollar organization that uses tech. What you can do is you can dominate everybody else if you focus on the relationships which are based on humans. And so I would, I'm always trying to figure out where can I find awesome people and an open space. Awesome person comes in, I'm going to figure out how to have them be a part of the culture. That's where I put the money. You put it into human capital first and foremost. Fantastic. Amazing. Loved it. Right. Loved it. So I was like, yeah, totally uh, enjoyed. I love this, this yeah, episode. Absolutely. <laughs> you dropped some gold there, man. Really appreciate you taking the time and coming on, Damien. Uh, you know, your, your wisdom. I mean, your, um, definitely your uh, reputation preceded you, but now that it, it's a true fact. I'm really, really loved having you on, man. Yeah. Does it have to be over? <laughs> <laughs> do you have an extra hour here? <laughs> uh, Damien, if you could just let everybody know, what is the best way people can reach you? Uh, best way to reach me is, I mean, you can, you can find me through financial underdogs. I think that's the best way to, to get more and to learn more. There's, there's stuff you can learn about with the retirement space. And, and uh, hopefully that's, that's in the show notes and people can go bounce around. If you Google me, you'll, you'll end up finding, and I, I say that tongue in cheek, cause I, I beat up on Google a lot with what they do, but I really, the place where I live and share and continue this, this experience of, of, of giving and, and living my purpose is, is on that show on financial underdogs. It's where I can speak to everyone and, and share the best of who I am in an ongoing way. So definitely reach out to me and, and listen to financial underdogs and, um, there's going to be more coming. Absolutely. You, you, you gained two new super yeah. fans today. So <laughs> thanks right, so much man. for being here. Today, thanks for being Dan. here. Appreciate you guys having me.